Thank you so much for being here. We are so glad that you're here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We had a fantastic day yesterday with our car show, and we got to meet a lot of people. And so God has been good to provide us that resource and those people and, and, a, and a great day um, of fellowship. And so we're going to continue that as we gather together to worship this morning. And this is a special day as we, uh, as we honor our uh, graduating senior. Uh, here's what Romans 13, 7 says. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls. And here we go. Respect to those you owe respect and honor to those you owe honor. And we're going to honor our graduating senior, Adam Young. Will you stand with me as we uh, enter his processional?
morning. You can be seated. Thank y'all so much for joining us this morning. Uh, I wanted to welcome y'all and to, uh, where's my cheat sheet? Hold on a minute. Uh, I wanted to encourage you, if you are a, a guest here, um, we have a little tab that you can fill out and tear out and put in the offering plate when it's taken up at the end of the service. If you wouldn't mind doing that, that way we could have a record of your visit and we can pray for you. Also, there's a place in there for you to write specific prayer requests, uh, and we would love to be praying for you. I also want to uh, take a moment to honor our graduating senior, Adam James Young. And Adam is the son of Jeremy and Carrie Young. He, uh, his high school accomplishments has been most outstanding brass for three years, uh, law, law, pra- uh, sorry, law practicum, uh, National Technical Honor Society, uh, Bearcat Strong Award, and Varsity Catcher. Uh, his clubs and organizations he's been involved with has been the high school baseball team, marching and concert band, and Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He has received scholarships, uh, athletic scholarship to Oklahoma Wesleyan, uh, academic scholarships to Mary Harden Baylor, Southern Nazarene, Henderson State, and Oklahoma Baptist University. His future goals is to attend Oklahoma Wesleyan in Bart- Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and will play baseball and study sports management, get married and raise a godly family. His, yeah, that's, that's sweet. Uh, <laughs> his degree... <laughs> The degree he is pursuing is sports management. Uh, And a fun fact about himself is that he can play five instruments, multi-talented, I know we're all jealous. Trombone, bass trum, bass trum, I'm so sorry, bass trombone, tuba, and euphonium, and bass guitar. And so everyone give a hand for Adam James Young. I'm going to join you right here, Adam, for a moment. How you doing today? You excited about what's about to happen next for you? Big, th- big things going on. You know, I remember when you got here. Like when you got here. So I've watched you grow all the way to where now you're taller than everybody in your family almost. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I'm excited for you, and we are. And I know that you being our only senior, you know what? It occurs to me that there may be other times in your life when you have to stand alone as a believer in Christ. And so we as your church family are proud of what you've achieved, but we're also proud of what God is going to do through your life going forward. And so we're here. We're here today, but we're here in an ongoing way for you. Anytime you need us in your life, and it's our privilege today to encourage you in this way. And it's also my privilege to lead us in prayer, just asking that God will strengthen you for every part of your journey going forward. And so I'm very proud of you. I also remember, by the way, whenever I baptized you, you, you don't remember that, do you? You do. You remember. Well, the one thing I remember is, is your mom said to me, she said, the one thing that Adam is afraid of is that I'm going to call him by his brother's name. When I'm... <laughs> but I didn't do that. I got Adam, and so you're Adam, and you're Adam, and you're individual, and God's made you that way, and we're proud of who you've become. So let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for this young man. Lord, you have, you have placed him in his family and in the larger family of First Baptist Church. And it's been a a great privilege just to watch him grow and mature and develop. And I know that there's so much of his life that is ahead of him. And what I want to pray for him this morning is that you will be such an integral part of everything that he is and everything that he becomes. And that his life will center on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that his faith in you will sustain him in every challenge, in every circumstance. And Lord, that that He will honor you in the living of His life as He moves into this next phase, this next part of His journey. His collegiate life, His adult life, His family life, everything that's in front of Him. I just pray that He will know the strength of God. That you'll watch over Him and protect Him and care for Him and that you'll use Him mightily to honor and glorify your great name. So thank you for Adam and his achievements and accomplishments. 
that we're honoring today. Please bless him as he goes forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, Abby. As I was selecting music this week, I was thinking of you because you are a senior, our graduating senior, and I selected this song called He Will Keep You, and it's based on Psalm 121, and, and I thought that maybe as you embark on this new chapter in your life, that you may find yourself at times wondering what's going on and what your future holds and, and the, the challenges you may face, and so here's what Psalm 121 says to you and to all of us. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This song is taken directly from Psalm 121, and it applies to you, Adam, and it applies to all of us. He will keep you.
this morning we will conclude our study of the book of Hebrews. It has been a wonderful journey, at least as far as I'm concerned. I've grown so much and learned quite a lot and am excited to come to these final verses in chapter 13 this morning. And so I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be considering the verses in verses 18 through 25 today as we will be talking about the topic, the subject, Courageous Christianity. Pray for us 
For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I've written to you in a few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. So as we begin to talk this morning about courageous Christianity, I think that it's important for us to talk about courage a little bit. Uh, what is courage? What is not courage? How does courage come our way? What does this even mean when we say courageous Christianity? W.T. Sherman defined courage as having a perfect sensibility of the measure of danger and a mental willingness to endure it. Let me say that for you again. He defined courage as having a perfect sensibility of the measure of danger and a mental willingness to endure it. In other words, you, you know what the danger is, and you are determined in your mind that you're going to withstand, you're going to endure in the face of that danger. So courage has to do with the way we relate to something that might be dangerous to us. Let me tell you what courage is not. Uh, uh, Adrian Rogers used to tell the story of a man who claimed to be courageous because he said that he had cut off the tail of a lion. And so someone asked him this question, and they said, well, that sure sounds courageous. Why didn't you cut off his head? He said, well, somebody else had already done that. <laughs> That's not courage. <laughs> yeah. There's another story about a condemned prisoner who, when offered his last meal, he said, I want you to bring me a whole basket full of mushrooms. And they asked him, why in the world for your last meal would you ask for a whole basket of mushrooms? He said, well, I've always wondered what they taste like, but I've always been afraid to eat them before. <laughs> it's not courage. He didn't have anything to lose. There was going to be no cost if it went the other way for him. So in order to understand courage, we need to understand what courage is not as opposed to what courage is. I want to tell you that in the world that we live in, it takes zero level of courage to come to a, a church house, to a sanctuary, a worship center, and to sit and sing songs or stand and sing songs and listen to a message and go on our way. That takes zero courage in my opinion. But now there are some places in the world where if you choose to assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it takes tremendous courage. So courage can be relative. It can all be dependent on the circumstances that surround the action. Courage is only present when the action that is desired or required has some risk attached to it. If there's no cost, there's no courage. There was a, another, there's a story that was told to be true about a man whose house was situated where his kitchen window looked out over a creek. And the creek had a tendency whenever the storms came to become a, a raging, flooding torrent of, of water. And so this man was sitting at his breakfast table having his morning coffee one day, and as he watched the, the creek come flooding down, he saw a, a young girl who had been, I guess, fallen into the stream and was being carried along by the water. And the man jumped up, and he ran, and he got, tried, tried his best to run ahead and get ahead of the girl, and he finally did. And when he got there, he jumped into the creek and held on to her because he knew that there was this huge culvert that was soon going to come that would drain out into a body of water where if she went into that, she would have no chance at all for survival. And so he held on to this girl and began to hope that he could hold her until somebody came, and he struggled, and finally he got himself and her out of that raging creek and... That requires a lot of courage, but when you add to that the fact that the man did this and he was even unable to swim, you see that there's a lot of courage involved in that situation. So risk. Risk determines 
the level of courage that's enacted or exacted from a situation whenever we participate in it. Sometimes the call to Christian living might seem like jumping into a raging river and not knowing how to swim. So where does the courage come from to live the kind of life that we're required to live as Christians in a world that isn't always sympathetic or, or tolerant of what we might believe and what we might proclaim? Where does that courage, that kind of courage, and that kind of boldness come from? How does it become a part of our makeup as a believer, a person who follows the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let me remind you, as we've been making our way through the book of Hebrews, I've told you on occasion that if the book of Hebrews is anything at all, it is a, it is a, a call from the author of this book to those who've become timid and fearful in their faith to step up and to become courageous in their Christianity in the world they're walking through. It is a call to courageous Christianity. This entire book is about us being courageous as Christians, and particularly to those that it was written to who were facing persecution and difficulty. So this is a call to courageous Christianity. And, and I don't believe for one second that whenever we come to the end of the journey of this book, that the author is going to, to step apart from that call. I think that what he does in this concluding section of the book is he actually continues to talk to them about some things that would help as we try to be courageous in this life that we're called to live. So I want to take the next few minutes and talk about some elements within this passage that I believe contribute to courageous Christianity. So as the writer closes out this letter, there are several final remarks that I think surpass just a meaningless closing to this significant document. In fact, these elements that contribute to courageous Christianity are things that I think if we would see them implemented in and around our lives, we might see the, the courage that we have as believers begin to grow and expand. And we might see ourselves able to step up and to be counted in a much more significant way for the cause of Christ. See, the author, as he speaks, as he writes to these fellow believers, he does so from the perspective of one who actually needs the same level of courage that they do. See, whether you're a preacher or whether you're someone who works in the secular world, whether you're a parent, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a retiree, whatever, whatever station you find yourself in life, the same level of Christianity is, courage is required for all of us to live the fullness of the level of Christianity that we're expected by God to live. So we need to know what's going on here. The author needs the same level of courage that he's calling those that he's writing to to experience. So what fuels that courage that he's calling them to? What, what, what brings that process into place in the lives of these individuals? What, what contributes to courageous Christianity? First thing is this. Concerted prayer to God contributes to courageous Christianity. Whenever the author is writing these words, the first three words in verse 18, pray for us. He, he doesn't say at this moment, I know that y'all are struggling as believers. I know that you're stumbling a little bit along the way. I know that you've become, begun to be fearful in your faith. And so I'm praying for you. No, this is the author saying to those that he's writing to about their fearfulness of their faith. He says, I need you to pray for us. I'm asking you to pray for us. I don't know how many times those words, I'm praying for you, have brought confidence and comfort and, yes, courage to my life. As, as I navigate the call of God on my life or the circumstances that surround my own personal life, whenever somebody looks at me and says, I am praying for you, I want you to know that brings comfort, that brings courage, that brings encouragement to me. And so when the author says this, I want you to know it's not just a way to close out this letter. He's offering these words as a sincere plea to those that he's writing to. He means it. He's really asking them to pray for him because his belief is that within prayer, there is a power 
that doesn't come any other way. It doesn't come in any, from any other source. And so the, for him, his belief in the power of prayer prompts him to ask for prayer from others to those that he's writing to. In fact, the knowledge that this is happening, the knowledge that people are praying for him, tends to instill courage in his own life in the face of the trials that are before him. And I want to say to you that whenever you face situations that cause you to stumble or you feel weakened in your faith, you feel diminished in your capacity to to remain determined to live out this life that God's called us into, the knowledge that someone is praying for you, the, 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 the sincere plea, the urgent request for someone to pray for you, when that begins to happen, it's amazing. It's a miracle of God. It's the way God works And you can almost sense the surge of God's strength as it begins to make its way into your life. So it's a sincere plea. It's also a legitimate expectation. Believers ought to be able to expect that other believers would pray for them. There ought to be an expectation of prayer from one another among Christians. We we ought to be able to know that, that the brothers and sisters that we live life alongside would pray for us as the need arises. And so to know that a request for prayer is being taken seriously by fellow Christians is encouragement indeed to those who know that these prayers are being offered. So the first step to developing courageous Christianity is this concerted prayer to God. This contributes to the courage that we need to live this life before the world and and all that it has to, to present to us and against us in opposition to our faith. I need you to pray for me and you need me to pray for you. So we ought not to hesitate to look one another in the eye and to say, pray for me. Pray for me. And we ought to expect that our brothers and sisters are praying for us. We ought to know that that's happening. So the concerted prayer of believers is essential for courage to exist among those who are trying to live out this faith journey. There's a second thing that contributes to courageous Christianity. And look at what he goes on to say. We're confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. The second thing that I would say contributes to courageous Christianity is the knowledge that we have confident standing before God. He says we, have, we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things. What produces Confidence standing before God. What allows me to come into the presence of God with confidence? Back in the book of Hebrews, he says, we can come boldly before the throne of grace where we know that we can find grace to help in our time of need. What contributes to our ability to stand with boldness and confidence in the presence of a supreme, holy God? I'm going to tell you what will help us to be able to do that. That is a clean heart. He says, we know that we have a good conscience before God. I want to tell you, when your heart is clean before God, you know that you can come into His presence without anything hindering the flow of communication, of fellowship, of Him imparting to you what you need, what we need in our lives to live this life that He's calling us into. When my heart is clean before God and and I have right standing before Him, I know that I can come to God and He's going to receive me. He's going to receive me. He's not going to push me away. He's not going to say, no, you're not prepared. You're not ready to come into my presence. So a clean heart is important. A clean heart is essential. A good conscience allows us to have courage as we live this life. And let me tell you what this is about. This has to do with keeping short accounts with God. Can I say something to us this morning? There is never an advantage to keeping sin in your life. And there is never an advantage to continuing in sin in your life if you're living a sinful life right now. There's there's nothing about that that is going to be an advantage to you. How many of us at points in our lives have drifted off into some sinful behavior, some sinful attitude, some sinful mindset, And we thought, well, there's there's no real harm in this. There's no real danger. There's no real damage. And so we we just convince ourselves or we allow ourselves to be convinced by the enemy of our soul 
that this has, has no harm, that there's nothing about this that is difficult or damaging. I don't see any adverse effect in my life. I'm going to tell you something. There is no advantage to keeping sin or continuing in sin in your life. The best thing you can do with sin is to do exactly what God says, and that is to bring it right straight to the foot of the cross and to lay it there where the blood of Jesus can spill upon it and where the blood of Jesus can cleanse it and where the blood of Jesus can cover it and where your sin can be forgiven and where you can be made again right in the sight of God. And, and, and to, to continue in sin is, is the, the, the least wise thing that we can do as believers. Let me tell you, whenever we choose to keep sin in our life or continue in sin as a believing Christian, let me tell you what it does. It causes leaks in your courage container. Okay? If, if you have to come before God and you know that there's known sin in your life, you don't have the courage to stand before God. And if you have sin in your life that you know about, you don't have the courage to stand in the world for God. Because you're always afraid, you're always fearful that somebody's going to look into your life and see this black spot, and they're going to point their finger at you and say, who are you to say anything to me about my need to be forgiven of my sin before God? So the best thing you can do with your sin is to get rid of it and to do it now. Not when we're finished with this service, not later at your home, not out under the tree or on the lake, but right now is to say, God, take this sin from me. I don't need it in my life. Let me tell you something. If you've got sin in your life at this moment and you say to him, Lord, I am bringing my sin to you. I'm confessing it. I'm repenting of it right now. God will remove it from you. And the rest of this service will mean a lot more to you than, you, than, you, than it will if you continue to keep that sin and harbor it in your heart. Scripture says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me when I pray. So I need to be free from my sin. I need a clean heart and, and, and my sin needs to be dealt with. And I want to tell you, I can't deal with my sin on my own. Well, how many times have I tried? How many times have I said, okay, Lord, I, I'm, I'm going to just get rid of this habit. I'm going to get rid of this thought process. I'm going, to, I'm going to change my life and then I'll come to you. No, no, I need to come to God and let him take care of the sin that I have brought into my life, that I've allowed to take up residence in my heart. Once you do, I promise you there will be a, a freedom there will be a release. There will be a joy that you can't know any other way as long as you continue to hold tightly to your sin. So we need a clean heart before God. That lends itself to boldness and confidence and courage in our Christian faith. The second thing that is present in, in this, this idea of confidence standing before God, not only do we need a clean heart, but we need a consistent walk. Look at what he says. He says we have a good conscience and in all things we are desiring to live honorably, to live honorably, to, to continue with a life that honors God. And so, and so to walk in honor before God or to honor God with our life means that, that the, the balance of our life, the weight of our life is correct. We talked a, a couple of weeks ago about, about uh, a quote where one said that our talk certainly seems to often outdistance our walk. Well, here what happens whenever our lives are honorable. That means that whenever you put our lives on, on the balance, the scale, that on one side you have the walk and on the other side you have the talk, and they're even. That what you're saying is absolutely true about what you're doing. And so the truth is that whenever we begin to, to, to talk about our faith and to live out our faith, if, if, if our life is, is less than what we're saying is true, then our lives are not honorable. Our lives are dishonorable. Our lives are dishonest before God. And Scripture says that a just weight is, is approved and pleasing to God and a false balance is an abomination to Him. If you're saying one thing but living another in your Christian faith, it says your life is an abomination before God. So this is about pursuing a life where your walk and your talk are the same and where they're both pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is about living a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit of God and driven by the Holy Spirit of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And I want you to know that whenever you have a, a life that is Scripture-based and Spirit-empowered, then you have a life that honors God. And whenever you have a life that honors God and a clean heart, then you have right standing before God and you can be confident in the presence of God, and you can be bold in your faith and courageous in your Christianity in this world that you're walking through. Amen. That's a fact. So we need to trust God at His Word and let Him have our sin and get clean before Him if we're holding on to things 
that are causing us to be less than courageous in our Christian living. Last thing that we find here in this passage, and it's really sort of in a group in these last few verses, we have concerted prayer to God that gives us boldness and courage. We have confidence standing before God that contributes to confident Christianity. Finally, we have continual sanctification by God that contributes to courageous Christianity. Look at what he says. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Here he, he talks about the sanctifying work of God, that, that continuing work of God that is ever-present, where he, he, he works in our life to, to continually transform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of sanctification. That's the work where He brings to bear upon our lives the work of correction, the work of instruction, the work of, 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 of leadership and guidance, the work of, of prompting us and moving us along the path of His will and His way. So how does sanctification happen? First of all, it happens through His power, through the power of God. He says, the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. He's referring to that amazing power of God that affected a resurrection from the dead. Now I want to tell you, if God can raise the dead, if God can raise the dead, He might be able to wake up some Christians. Right? In, in, in the book of Romans, 13th chapter, Paul says, now it's high time for us to wake up out of our sleep. I want to tell you, the world waits today for believers that are wake up and answer the call, for believers who will step up and accept the challenge. And so it's time for us to, to rise out of our sleep, out of our slumber, and to face the world in the courage of Christ. And, and he, so he says that this happens through the resurrection power of God. He speaks about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Then he also speaks about the redemption of sinners that's accomplished by, by God through Jesus. He says, He raised Him from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep who through the blood of the everlasting covenant makes us complete. That blood is the redemptive power of God brought to bear upon the sinfulness of humanity. And whenever the, re, the resurrection of Jesus, the power of that resurrection is present in our lives and the redemptive work of God brings forgiveness for our sins, then through His power we are being sanctified. He's doing it. We don't have to clean ourselves up. We don't have to get ourselves straight. What we do is we submit ourselves to God and by His grace He works in our lives to take care of all of those areas of our lives that need transformation, that need redirection, that need inspiration, that need instruction, that need correction. He does that through His power. So, through His power, He sanctifies. But He also does this not just through His power, but He does it according to His purpose. How many of us know in this room today that whenever God reaches toward us in grace, calls us to Himself in, in redemption and salvation, that He doesn't do that just to sit us on a shelf. We're not, we're not just those who are, are ornaments in the kingdom of heaven, but He does this. He calls us to Himself for His good purposes. And, and, and Scripture tells us that He's working all things out in our lives according to His purpose, according to His will. And so His sanctifying work is not just about the power of God brought to bear on our lives that need conforming and transforming, but it's also about His purpose in our lives that moves us along the path of His purpose and His will for us. He speaks about accomplishing His plan through us. Look at what He says. He says He's making you complete, which is perfect or, or, or total, in every good work to what? Do His will. See, Christianity is about both being, it's about being redeemed, it's about being born again, it's about being a child of God, but it's also about doing. It's about doing the will of God. Learning what God has called us to Himself for, for, for His purposes to do and to accomplish in and through our lives. God wants us to be active. He wants us to be engaged in kingdom work, in kingdom activity. And so He calls us 
to do His will. And then, but here's the great thing about it. When He does this, He does this again by His power. He says He is working in you. He's working in you, doing all things. And this becomes part of your life that now is pleasing to Him because your life is in total submission to the Lordship of Christ. Your life is in total control and surrender to the Holy Spirit of God. Your life is in total compliance with the Word of God. And so your life, as you move along these truthful ways, is now accomplishing the will of God. But it is God who works in us both to do and to will, both to will and to do His good pleasure. That's what God's about. And so we submit ourselves to Him, and He begins this work of sanctifying. It's an ongoing work of God's presence and power brought to bear on our lives where He deals with us when we need to be dealt with. He, he reminds us when we need to be reminded. He rebukes us when we need to be rebuked. He corrects us when we need to be corrected. And He leads us whenever we need to be led. He does all of these things for us. And in this process, our lives become well-pleasing unto Him. So, courageous Christianity. How does it come? It comes when we know that we're being prayed for by our brothers and sisters in Christ. It comes when we know our lives are clean and we're being spirit-filled and spirit-led. It comes when we know that God is working in us to accomplish His good will and His good work and His good pleasure. When these things are true about our lives, we are so much more likely to be courageous in this journey, this life that God has called us to. And I want to tell you something. Whenever this document was written, it was written to a group of people that they needed courage. They needed courage to be the church in their day. They needed courage to be the light in their day. They needed courage to, to, to be in the world as those who were, were the, the carriers of the gospel truth to that world. They needed courage to do that. Can I say to us this morning that courage, courageous Christianity is as essential today as it has ever been? The world that we're walking through is, is, is growing more every day in its, in its intolerance and in its inability to understand the, the moral positions of Christian ethics and behavior. And for us to, to be able to face that world and, and, and to, to courageously tell it the truth it's going to become harder and harder. It's going to exact more and more. There's going to be more and more cost and more and more risk to doing that if things continue the current trends. And so how are we going to be faithful if we don't have courage? How are we going to have courage if we don't have people praying for us and God's Spirit pouring through us and sanctification by God happening in us? How, how is this going to happen? How do we get to the place where we know this is happening? I'm going to give you... Two things, two thoughts. The first thing that we need to do is we need to practice the disciplines of the Christian life consistently. We need to fortify ourselves and we need to equip ourselves. We need to be ready. We need to be ready and we need to be willing. We need to be capable. So we need to, to buck up and Take up the charge and the challenge that's issued to us from the throne of God through the inspired writings of the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, we need to keep a close watch on every area of our life and make sure that there's nothing about us that causes us to retreat in timidity or fearfulness because we're not where we need to be with God. We need to, we need to pursue passionately, purposefully, the path that God's established for us. Courage isn't always easy. You may not have ever heard of a senator from long ago named Edmund G. Ross of Kansas. In fact, some people have affectionately, I guess, or disaffectionately nicknamed him as Mr. Nobody. There's no law that bears his name. There's not a single list of Senate greats that mention his service. Whenever he entered the Senate in 1866, he was considered the man to watch because he was a key vote in some very important decisions. Remember the year 1866, you know that's the aftermath of the North-South conflict, the Civil War. And he seemed 
destined to surpass his colleagues, but one courageous act of, conf of conscience set the stage for him becoming who he ultimately was. Let's think about what was going on. The, the con there was a, a, divi a division in the government in the wake of the Civil War. President Andrew Johnson was determined to follow President Lincoln's policy of reconciliation toward the defeated South. Congress, however, wanted to rule the downtrodden Confederate states with an iron hand. So Congress decided to strike first. Shortly after Senator Ross was seated, the Senate introduced impeachment proceedings against the president. The radicals concluded, calculated they needed 36 votes and smiled as they concluded that the 36th vote was none other than Senator Ross. The new senator listened to the talk, and to the surprise of many, he declared these words. He said, the president deserves as fair a trial as any accused man has ever had on this earth. The word immediately went out that his vote was shaky. Ross received an avalanche of anti-Johnson telegrams from every section of the country. Radical senators were, senators were badgering him to come to his senses. The day of the vote arrived and the courtroom galleries were packed. Tickets for admission were at an enormous premium. And as the death-like stillness fell over the Senate chamber, the vote began. By the time they reached Ross, 24 guilties had been announced. 11 more were certain that this 35 of the 36. So only Ross's vote was needed to impeach the president. Unable to conceal his emotion, the chief justice asked in a trembling voice, Mr. Senator Ross, how vote you? Is the respondent Andrew Johnson guilty as charged? Ross later explained his sentiment at that moment. This is what he said about himself. I looked into my open grave. My, he said, friendships, position, fortune, and everything that makes life desirable to an ambitious man were about to be swept away by the breath of my mouth, perhaps forever. Then the answer came, unhesitating, unmistakable, not guilty. With that, the trial was over. And Ross lost every opportunity that he would have to be what everybody thought that he could be and would be. All because his conviction fed into a courage that caused him to take a stand in spite of what everybody else thought he should do. The kind of courage that he spoke about when, when our convictions and our positions and our choices cause us, as it were, to look into our open grave and to say, if I take this stand, it may be the death of me, reputationally, or maybe even physically, but by God's grace, I know what is right and I will choose to be courageous in my Christian faith, whatever it costs me. That's the kind of courage that the book of Hebrews calls for Christians to take up. I'm going to tell you, and it's in the world all around us right now, there are, there are churches, at least they call themselves churches, that are taking positions that are so worldly and so godless that, that, it's, that it's amazing to me that they would even keep the name church above their door. There are Christians who are positioning themselves on platforms so that they can, can call on the world to denounce any form of Christianity that doesn't support and endorse and tolerate any behavior that the world says now is normal or right. And one of two things is going to happen with the church, this, the true church. Either the church is going to remain silent and it's going to be swept off of the map. Or the church is going to stand up and pay the price, accept the risk, be courageous, boldly proclaim the gospel, tell people who Jesus is, and tell them why He came, and that He died for our sins so that we don't have to live in our sin. And that they can be saved from that deceived, damaged lifestyle, that deceived perspective that causes them to embrace everything that is a lie straight out of hell. So who will we be? Well, truth is, I can't speak for you. You can't speak for me. But I can speak for me.
and you have to speak for you. Will you say, I'll be courageous in my faith and share with the world the message of God's truth or I'm just going to remain silent. I'm going to sit on the sidelines and just whatever will be, will be. If you do, if you do, don't bemoan whatever happens in generations to come when your children or your children's children or your children's children's children don't have a church to go to. Or if they're able to, it'll be illegal for them to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to step up. It's time to be counted. It's time to be courageous in our Christianity. I'm asking you to bow your heads, please. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I'm going to call us to an opportunity for commitment. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and you would like to, you'd like to explore that, in just a few moments, we're going to have folks standing down here at the altar. Our staff will be here, and they'll be more than delighted to share with you how you can know Jesus, how you can be forgiven for your sin, how you can receive the gift of everlasting life through belief on Jesus Christ. Would you come to one of us and just share with us your need, your desire to know that when this life is over, that you're going to be declared righteous in the sight of God because of your belief in His Son. Just come to one of us. Maybe you're here and today you're, you're saying, you know, it is, it's time for me to step up. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need accountability with that. We'd be happy to pray with you about that. Maybe you just need to pray where you are and say, Lord God, please help me. Help me to stand up and be counted for the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God. Maybe you're here today and it's time for you to to unite with this church family. You believe God's calling you here. You sense that God has a message of truth for you to hear and a message of truth for you to share that can be planted into your life through this church and you want to be a formal part of it. Please come to one of us and just tell us if that's what you're ready to talk about and we want to help you with that too. And I ask you to stand to your feet with your heads bowed. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father, today we, I, we think about a man in that last illustration, that last story 150 or so years ago that was willing to stand up and be counted in, the, in the, the political arena because his conviction and his conscience and his courage forced him to take a stand. Lord, if somebody can take a stand in that arena, surely we in the, the world of Christ, the world of church, the world of the kingdom of God, certainly we can take a stand. So please give us the fortitude, the grace, and the courage to step up for you today, to do whatever you're asking us to do. So we wait before you now, and as we do, we ask you to move and to speak to our hearts and draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name, if you need to come, you come right now. Our men are down front. We'll wait for you. You come. If you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, come today. Please don't wait. Don't delay. Now's the time. Maybe you need to meet God at the altar of His church. Maybe you need to come down here and just bow your life before Him and say, Lord, I need to be courageous. Or maybe you need to say, Lord, I need to be clean. Whatever God's saying to you, it's time for you to come. Let's don't wait.